Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to University Park United Methodist Church in what suddenly feels like fall. This is the third Sunday in October, our stewardship focus month, when I'm asking all of us to think through our dreams and our visions for our church in the coming year and how we might join together to support them. The author of the book of Proverbs writes, without vision, the people perish. The dreams and visions, I believe, that God leads us to embrace for this congregation are every bit as important as our financial gifts and our service to the ministry that we share. In fact, it is our dreams, it is our visions that inspire and guide those gifts and the spiritual practices of service in which we engage. So this month, I'm asking all of us to think about where God is guiding our church and how we might support that vision in the year to come. University Park United Methodist Church is an open and affirming congregation. Our vision for ministry here at U Park is to be an intergenerational, diverse, radically inclusive Christian community where families and individuals of all kinds can thrive. So whoever you are, whatever you may believe or question or doubt, you are welcome here at University Park United Methodist Church. If this is your first time worshiping with us, or if it's your first time back in a long time, we are delighted to extend a special welcome to you. If you're joining us on Facebook or on YouTube this morning, we're very glad to have you with us, and I hope that soon you can be here in person in our sanctuary to worship with us on a Sunday morning. I'll be in the lobby after worship, and if you'd like to know more about the congregation or you just want to say hi, I would love to talk with you. As we begin our time together this morning, please do take just a moment. Let us know that you're here by jotting down your name in the attendance pads that you'll find at the ends of your pews. If you'd like to receive our newsletter or other communication from the church, you can include your email address as well. Lauren Cowden is our youth ministry director, and I want to invite Lauren forward now to tell us about a few things coming up in the life of our church over the next couple of weeks. Good morning. good morning. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. We have lots up and coming in the life of our church. First, this week, Isaac Dunn will be hosting a workshop here at University Park United Methodist Church titled Walking Our Loved Ones Home, an Introduction to Hospice and End of Life Spiritual Care. This workshop, like I said, will begin this week on Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., just right next door in our library, and all are welcome to attend. Next week, next Sunday, is our Trunk or Treat community event. I can't believe it. This is um, going to be taking place after worship services on Sunday at 1230 outside in our parking lot, weather permitting. Pray for some good weather, but there's going to be lots of fun, candy, a costume contest and a food truck, but we are still looking for volunteers to donate decorating their trunks. So if you are interested, I see a hand back there. Rodney, thank you. Um, if you're interested in decorating your trunk, please do let either one of the staff members know, um, and we look forward to seeing you next week. All Saints Day is Sunday, November 3rd. Um, we are, we will be acknowledging and celebrating the lives of those who have passed this year. If you have someone you'd like to acknowledge or celebrate, um, I encourage you to send their picture as well as their information to Bethany's um, email address on the screen. And last but not least, our Youth Park youth and a lot of youth groups locally in Colorado and Denver will be coming together and participating in the annual Food for All event, which is a canned food drive event, packing Thanksgiving boxes for families in need. This year, the youth are responsible for 300 cans of cranberry and 20 $25 gift cards to King Supers. So if you would like to participate in this event, you can just bring in your cans and gift cards to the reception desk or to any one of our staff. And like I said, this event will be Sunday, November 17th from 1 to 3 at Highlands United Methodist Church. All youth are welcome to attend. We will be carpooling to this event. For any more information regarding the live the events happening in the life of our church, you can stay connected with us by signing up for our weekly newsletter via email, or you can check out the bulletin boards and the flat screen TVs in our lobby. Now, in this time of the service, I'm going to ask you to stand as you are able and greet your neighbors by passing the peace of Christ.
Good morning. Good morning. Please stand as you're able for the call to worship. Welcome to worship at this turn of the season. As temperatures dip, we seek the warmth of God's presence. As the darkness grows, we seek God's light. As the earth rests, we long for God's peace. Praise be to God, the keeper of our days. days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nation shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his way and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall we learn shall they learn war any more may god bless the hearing and understanding of these words
Let's pray together. Lord God, you have drawn us here, and we turn toward you now with hearts and minds open that the words on the pages of your scriptures might truly become your word for us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, decades ago, literally, actually decades ago, when I was a student at the Iliff School of Theology across the street, I did what a lot of people who are studying to go into the ministry do. I got a series of jobs in churches. It was a great way to kind of supplement my Iliff education and to experiment, right? Try out things that I was learning in school and see how they worked in the real world of churches day in and day out. Now, one of my jobs during that period of time was as a youth director. I was in youth ministry at this church in Boulder. Kind of like Lauren does here, our church teamed up with other Methodist congregations around the area to put together events that all the youth groups could attend together. So one weekend, we took a bunch of middle school youth, middle school youth sorry, from four or five different churches up to a place called Buckhorn Camp, which is a Methodist camp in the mountains outside of Fort Collins. The other youth directors and I put together this sort of weekend schedule of activities, as one does if you're planning a youth retreat. And for the first night of the retreat, we planned a combination kind of Bible study and getting to know each other session. We were going to start but actually, after some games and some playing around outside, we were going to come inside and we were going to start by asking students if they had a favorite Bible story or a favorite Bible verse. And then each of the youth leaders were going to share ours and talk about what we loved about them. Now, this was a group of about 30 middle schoolers all together in one big room. The kids were kind of hyped up because, like I said, they were laughing and talking. We'd started outside. We were running around. We were playing games. We were burning off some energy in this beautiful beautiful place. There was a certain amount of joking and laughing and loud talk around the circle. Of course, some of the kids were a little nervous. It was kind of what you'd expect at the beginning <laughs> of a middle school retreat. So we started talking about favorite Bible verses, and we told the kids, don't worry, we don't expect you to be Bible scholars or have every word memorized or anything like that. We, they didn't have to give us, you know, exact quotes. We were just asking if there was anything in the Bible that they found memorable or comforting, something from which they could draw strength. I remember one girl quoted the passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or one of the boys said that when he was having a hard time and was struggling, he would think of the passage from Isaiah where God tells the people, do not fear for I am always with you. Other kids had other answers. Then some of the youth directors began to share our favorite passages. And when it came to my turn, I read from the 11th chapter of the prophet Isaiah, a text that I've always loved. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. And as I was reading, this kind of quiet began to descend on the circle of kids. The restlessness that had been there began to fade away, to disappear. I could feel the kids, I could feel them lean in almost to hear more closely. I saw them kind of struggling to catch the words. I don't know what it was, but there was something about that passage that had caught their imagination, caught their attention. I finished with the last line, and they shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And for 10 or 15 seconds, the whole group of us just sat there. Nobody said anything. Now, at that time in my life, I had not yet heard the old saying that silence is God's first language. But as I look back on it now, I do think God was speaking to us. God was speaking to us in Isaiah's ancient poetry, 
and in the silence that followed. God was speaking to us in that ancient, compelling vision and in the yearning that we felt in our hearts for a world where that vision could be real. Throughout Christian and Jewish scripture, there are many such beautiful, compelling dreams, these descriptions of what the world will be like when all of creation comes to its final fruition, when we finally fulfill the purposes for which God created each and every one of us. In the Bible's final book, The Revelation to John, John of Patmos writes, a voice cried out, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people and God will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more, and mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for all the first things have passed away. John goes on to describe what he calls the heavenly city, where gold is not a thing to be hoarded uh, in wealth. In fact, the streets are paved with it so everyone can enjoy its beauty. The city has no need to ever close its gates. It is always shining with God's presence, and a river flows through it with a tree on the banks whose leaves contain medicine to heal all the nations. A few minutes ago, we heard Phyllis read another one of my favorites from the second chapter of Isaiah. The prophet says the time will come. The time will come when all our weapons of war are transformed into farming tools so everyone can eat. The prophet Micah wrote about an age to come when everyone could sit in peace beneath their own vine and fig tree and there would be no one to make them afraid. A few centuries later, as the kingdom of Judah was quite literally being conquered, being overrun by the army of the empire of Babylon, the prophet Jeremiah wrote that even then, God had not abandoned them. The day would come, he said, when houses and vineyards and fields shall once again be bought in this land. Now, in Jeremiah's time, of course, no one believed him. And it would be understandable, I think. It would be understandable if we just kind of rolled our eyes when we heard stuff like this. For one thing, this kind of poetry is exactly the sort of gauzy promise that has been used to manipulate people for centuries. Slaves in this country were told to, you know, obey their masters and not complain about their situation. So eventually, they'd be in heaven where all this good stuff was waiting for them. Or poor people throughout the early industrial period were all told the same thing. Know your place, fulfill your role in society, and remember, God will give you all these wonderful things later. But somehow, later just never quite seemed to arrive. And meanwhile, all the people who profited from those early industrial workers were doing quite well. So if we're suspicious of these beautiful scriptural promises of someday, well, we kind of have good reason to be. Now, of course, the other reason we might be more than a little bit skeptical of all these lovely dreams and visions for the future is that even the most recent of them, even the most recent of those writings was written almost 2,000 years ago. And as compelling as they are, as powerful a yearning as they might awaken in our hearts, those visions have never been reality. Isaiah, Amos, Micah, they all wrote during a time of deep, angry division between rich and poor when wealthy, powerful kings and others of the ruling class made their money exploiting and impoverishing others. This group of people we call the 8th century prophets because they wrote and lived about 8 centuries before the birth of Jesus. They're all very clear about this and they're all very clear that God is none too pleased with what the rulers are doing. When Jeremiah wrote, the kingdom of Judah was losing its power and then, as I said, was eventually conquered by the Babylonian Empire. John of Patmos wrote the Revelation partly to condemn the Roman Empire. Rome claimed to be the eternal kingdom of perpetual light and peace and prosperity, but was actually sustained by slavery and cruelty, by exploitation and violence. And John wrote his beautiful vision of the kingdom of God to expose the empire for what it was. So I don't know about you, but as I look around now at our world at the moment, sometimes it feels like we are maybe further than ever from the beautiful dreams those prophets shared. War in Gaza, 
in Israel, in Lebanon, Iran, Yemen, Ukraine, the persecution of Uyghurs in China, where more than a million people have been imprisoned in what are euphemistically called re-education camps, the ongoing persecution of Rohingya people in Myanmar, political violence and racist hate groups and the rise of Christian nationalism here in our own country, fascism being embraced around the globe. There is no shortage of horrors, no shortage of bad news in the world, but there sure does seem to be a distinct lack of vines and fig trees and streets paved with gold and swords and guns being transformed into tools to grow food. So in the face of all that violence, and that misery and that despair, I think it makes a whole lot of sense to ask why these beautiful dreams in Scripture matter. Why lift them up? Why pray through them? Why read them in worship? For that matter, why read them at all? I think this is an important question for Christianity in general, in the world in which we're living now. And I think it's also important for this congregation, this church right now, Today is the third Sunday, as I said earlier in the service, in our Dreams and Visions worship series. Throughout this month, I'm asking us to think about our dreams and our visions for our congregation, to think about who God is calling us to become and how we can support those dreams in the coming year. With the world in turmoil, with church membership and religious engagement declining all over the country, it is tempting to hunker down and just try to sort of maintain, hold our position. But I don't think that's what we're called to do. I don't think that's what the people of God have ever been called to do. God calls us to big visions, those compelling dreams. God calls us to embrace those dreams in faith, not because we think they're realistic or because we think we can accomplish them if we just draw the right kind of map or make the right kind of plan, but rather because we choose to believe that God does not and will never abandon the world to its own brokenness. Even, even if our dreams feel too big to achieve, even if God's dreams feel too big to achieve, to dream them, to dream them in faith is to refuse to accept the world as it is. And I believe that to walk toward those dreams is to be the people of God, to walk toward those dreams in faith, knowing that we do not walk alone, knowing that God is with us. Now, I know these scriptural dreams, these visions, I know they sound improbable. Maybe our personal dreams for the church sound improbable too. But the important question, I think, is not when or how we will make all this happen. The important question is whether and how we will allow God to work in us and through us individually and as a church community to bring our individual personal relationships, our neighborhoods, our city, even that little bit closer to the dream of peace and safety and beauty that those prophets envisioned so long ago. It is true, clearly true, that there has never been a time of perpetual, perfect peace and love and justice. There's never been a time when somebody wasn't taking advantage of somebody else, harming somebody else for their own gain. That always happens. But I believe it is also true that there has never been a time, not ever, when God was not at work through people, through us, through our ordinary lives to draw the world closer to the kind of dreams that Scripture can inspire in us. We may not get there in our lifetimes, but that's almost, it seems to me, that's almost beside the point. Maybe the more important question isn't so much when we will get there, but what direction we are going and how we nurture ourselves and nurture each other and how we are sustained on the journey. Let me ask this all.
saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So each week during October, we're inviting people to speak to us during our stewardship moment about some of their dreams and visions for our church in the next year. I want to invite Lauren Cowden forward to talk to us about what she sees going on in our youth program and some of her dreams. As Pastor Andy mentioned, we are in the stewardship month of October. And I think it's important to ground ourselves in what stewardship means to all of us. To me, stewardship is the idea that God's people are responsible for uncovering, using, and appreciating the gifts God has given us. It involves caring for everything God created, such as people, animals, the land in which we live, and more importantly, ourselves. When I think about what it means for me to be a steward of faith and a steward of God's love, I think about faith in action. For we know faith without works is dead. This is just one of the truths I've shared with our youth, and unsurprisingly, this truth aligns with our youth's dreams and visions for U Park. Our youth envision a place where young people of all ages, of all races, of all genders, and of all sexual orientations can come just as they are and be committed to being in service to others. As a leader who works with our youth, my dream and vision for our youth ministry program here at U Park is to cultivate and sustain an expansive, brave group of young folks who know God and see God in our world and in others. It is my dream that we as role models can be the example of what it means to live by faith and not by sight, for we know the eternal prize is unseen and only given to us by God. I believe this dream and vision of mine is only possible if we acknowledge and accept that we first must engage in the inner work first. It is vital we know how to fill our own cup before we begin to pour into the cups of others. One of my favorite quotes is, the work we do on ourselves becomes our gift to everyone else. 
and I think this applies most importantly to our youth. I encourage all of us to continue to dream big, share your vision with God and with others, and continue to do the work necessary to make our dreams and visions come into fruition. If you'd like to support our youth ministry today, you can drop cash or check in the offering plates as the ushers come by. As always, I want to thank all of you from the youth and I, and from, I think, just all the youth in general that you come in contact with. Thank you for showing up for all of us. Thank you for supporting all of us. Thank you for praying for all of us. Um, and thank you for listening today. Um, I invite the ushers forward to receive the morning's offering. You know, in the first service, Lauren shared that she had asked some of our church's children and youth about their dreams for the future of our church. She asked one of, the, one of the little girls who goes to Sunday school, she asked, what are your hopes, your dreams for our church? And the answer was, more toys. So, <laughs> not a bad dream, right? I mean, let's pray. Lord, all that we have is a gift from you. Every moment of our lives comes to us by your grace. And so we thank you now for this opportunity to return to your use some of what you have given us. And we ask for your wisdom and your courage and your vision in using all that we have for the greater glory of your name and your kingdom. Amen. Let's join in our concluding hymn.
This week, may you always know that wherever you go, God goes with you. And dream big, guided by God, knowing that God will never abandon any of us. Go in peace. Thank you.